now we've got uh, changes in information technology. We see Arab feminists who are able to situate themselves and their grievances and arguments globally. Women and men who are comfortable with the internet, fluent in English, and anxious to communicate have begun to provide chronicles of their lives, um, uh, uh, dominant ideologies, governments, etc., criticisms in an uninhibited way online. Uh, a lot of you have obviously seen this this year, but it's been going on for several years since we saw, basically since the information boom in the mid-90s, we started to see women bloggers, uh, activists who are um, representing their uh, grievances in an open way. And this has been, there's been an interesting uh, element to this um, in the lead up, let's say, to the Arab Spring, because the anonymity afforded by the internet reproduces some of the invisible feminisms that we were talking about before, where you would have women and men expressing these grievances, but in a very uh, anonymous, secluded, invisible way. The Arab Spring has kind of pushed them out of invisibility in a lot of ways, but at least initially, we were starting to see sort of a resurgence of that um, uh, instinct to hide when one is challenging over systems. Uh, the impact of the information revolution on the Arab, on Arab women's voices is one that's become increasingly visible over the past year and a half. Uh, women have been active participants in these revolutions, uh, even sparking some of the largest movements, such as the Tahrir Square one in Egypt. While she was not alone in organizing and planning, the resistance to Mubarak's regime, Asma Mahfouz, a young Egyptian woman, posted a, a blog on YouTube and Facebook calling on Egyptians to join her in a protest on the square on January 25th. For those of you who have been keeping track, January 25th has now been called or been dubbed the Day of Rage as it marks the official beginning of the revolution against Mubarak. Over 50,000 people joined Asma on that square that day. Um, Iman al in Libya opened herself up to public shame, ridicule, and harassment by Gaddafi, uh, by exposing Gaddafi's regime and their practice, their well-documented practice of using rape as a weapon. Uh, she was raped repeated repeatedly by Gaddafi's forces uh, and appeared uh, in public, was arrested, and repeatedly gave interviews, despite the fact that she knew that, according to kind of traditional discourses of shame, uh, that she was supposed to keep that kind of, uh, of a narrative so she essentially ruined her, her life uh, in Libya by being open about this practice. Uh, in Syria, a 19-year-old blogger named Fadil Madouhi has been in prison since December of 2009 uh, for publishing a poem that she wrote that was critical of the Syrian government on her blog. Uh, her current fate is unknown. Her family hasn't been allowed to see her since early 2010. Uh, given the violent turns of, uh, turn of events in Syria recently, it is very likely that she has already been killed. Um, in Yemen, Tawakul Kerman has been leading hundreds of thousands of men and women uh, through the streets of Sana'a, calling for freedom of expression and government reform. She's a journalist, and her primary medium of expression, obviously, is through the press. Uh, and in Saudi Arabia, where the monarchy is trying to stave off a popular uprising with payoffs and promises, bloggers like Iman and Nahjan organized and in what they call Saudi Women Drive, uh, and they protested simply by being mobile. Uh, when the government recently declared, recently, like last week, declared that women would be allowed to stand for office and vote in municipal elections, women like Nahjan signed their names and uploaded videos of themselves telling the monarchy not to insult them with trivial concessions. Uh, they're asking for full democratic rights, something that will probably not gain traction until Saudi Arabia gets its own version of the Arab Spring. The past two decades, though, have been encouraging. Uh, innovative, innovative scholarship and activism, as well as the increasing availability of Arab women's literature in English and other languages, have brought Arab women out of their seclusion in Middle Eastern departments um, into wider feminist circles. The scholarship has sometimes reinforced, sometimes questioned the liberalizing discourses of modernity, liberal nationalism, and feminism that have been applied or misapplied to Arab women's experiences. And finally, we start to hear and see most of these voices that have been secluded for so long. Now, I've been talking about these women's voices for um, uh, 40 minutes. What I'm going to do now is give you five minutes to watch some of these women and hear, women and see, and hear some of their voices. So we will conclude with that.
ومن البهدله اللي شايفاها بعد من 30 سنه انا بعض النفسيين ولعوا في نفسهم انا يمكن يحصل باللي حصل في تونس يمكن نبقى بلد حاره بلد فيها عدل بلد فيها كرامه بلد الانسان فيها انسان بجد مش عايش كحيوان النهارده واحد منهم مات واعلنوا موته لقيت كل الناس واقفه بتقول لا حول ولا قوه الا بالله ده ما تكافر ده ما تعايش شهره يا جماعه حرام عليك انا نزلت وكتبت ان انا بنت وهنزل ميدان التحرير وهقف لوحدي هرفع يابطه يمكن الناس تحس انا نازله يوم 25 وهقول للفساد لا والنظام لا It is striking that there are many women here in Tahrir who are also pushing for more democracy. Do you think women are coming out of more out of the margins of society to demand their case? Most of the women here never came out of the houses. Some of them have been, some with the nikah, they came out. I usually get harassed when I have to show my identification card to government officials somewhere, and they find out who I am, and that I put complaints forward against Gaddafi's people. They humiliate me to the point where other people gather around and start saying that it's shameful to treat a Libyan woman that way. It is the same thing every day. Hey, cool. Safe, capable driver behind the wheel. <laughs> 